morning, everyone. And I really want to thank um, Josh and Jim for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. And I really want to give a special shout out to the staff. I know how much work it takes uh, throughout the year to organize this. I helped run this conference for 10 years, so I can say that from uh, personal experience. I also want to give a special shout out to Carl because at, you know, when he started this, Alzheimer's disease research really was a wasteland, not only at UCI, but almost at many universities throughout the world. So we are really indebted to Carl for really helping establish programs like the one you see here. And uh, for better or for worse, uh, you could blame him for recruiting me to UC Irvine. <laughs> So uh, I first want to start off with, I think, some very exciting news, and I hopefully for members of the community here, you will agree that this is uh, exciting news. Uh, and this has been a great year for uh, UCI. Uh, Money Magazine just rated UCI as the number one college uh, in America, and we bumped Princeton off of that spot. So that's about... <laughs> That's about as good news as uh, you can get. Uh, does that mean we're better than Harvard? Yes, yes it does. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, you could see that uh, we have gotten many other accolades. The New York Times described us as the number one university doing the most for the American dream. Uh, you know, Money Magazine, by the way, when they named us that, UCI became the first public university in the history of their rankings to ever hold that spot. Uh, so it's pretty remarkable. I think you'll see that we're on a really wonderful uh, trajectory. Now, as Josh and Jim alluded to, um, the mood has changed remarkably over the uh, past couple of days. I think if you would have gone to several Alzheimer's researchers uh, before the beginning of this week, we would have been talking about some of the news that uh, dominated the headlines over the summer. And they were all more or less the same. They were about one cl uh, failed clinical trial after another. Uh, I particularly like the one on the top left from CNN because they indicated that the announcement by Biogen in early March when they decided that they were going to stop the clinical trial because it didn't show that their interim data didn't seem to show any efficacy, CNN said this one hurts. And I think that described the feeling of almost all the Alzheimer's researchers at that time. And then this week, this was the headline. Uh, and this is from a, uh, bio, uh, a biotech journal called STAT. And it says, in a shocking reversal, Biogen to submit experimental Alzheimer's drug for approval. And so, as Josh alluded to, uh, I think the field is still in a bit of shock. We're trying to sort everything out. There's a lot of healthy dose of skepticism because, as you can imagine, people feel as though when you torture the data long enough, you're able to find what you're looking for. But so we'll have to, you know, still stay cautiously optimistic and hope that this will turn out to be uh, the answer that we've all been seeking for so long. Have to tell you from the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center perspective, we recognize that these clin clinical trials put a heavy burden on the participants. And I think on behalf of the UCI, ADRC, and in fact on all of the centers throughout the nation, I can say that we are highly appreciative to all of you for all you do to help us address this issue of Alzheimer's disease. We are in a war against this awful disorder and we need your help and we appreciate when um, you participate. And so just wanna let you know that we take that very seriously. So I think it's pretty clear to everyone in this room that Alzheimer's disease is the uh, plague of the 21st century. You could see on the slide uh, here what the demographics are looking like. Uh, there are about 5.8 million individuals that are impacted by this insidious disease. And if you look by the middle of the century, that number is going to triple. And that's just stunning. Economically, the costs are staggering, and you could see that right now it costs almost $300 billion to, to care for Alzheimer's patients, and one out of every five Medicare dollars goes to care for AD patients. Look at what's going to happen by 2050. You're going to see that that number is going to mushroom to about a trillion dollars a year. And it just seems unfathomable that our country is going to be able to invest in education and infrastructure uh, if we're going to be devoting so much money 
to Alzheimer's uh, care. And I think throughout the course of the day, you're going to hear a lot of speakers talk about that and some of the research that they're doing that's going to give you hope. Now, as uh, Carl alluded to, luckily the NIH has been in investing a lot of funds into research because the only way we're going to have a cure for Alzheimer's disease is through research. And if you look at the slide here, you could see that just a few years ago, NIH funding, federal funding, was barely at the half a billion dollar mark. And yet, over the last several years, there's been an incredible advancement. So we're right now at about 2.3 a uh, billion dollars a year. That's how much money Alzheimer's research uh, receives. And that's wonderful. Right now we're in a continuing resolution, so don't, we don't know exactly what the 2020 budget is, but we anticipate that that will go up uh, a little bit as well. And so it's gratifying to see that the federal government and the NIH are playing a lead in investing in Alzheimer's disease and trying to find the cure for it. And as you heard earlier, one of the ways that they invested uh, in uh, Alzheimer's disease was to establish these uh, Alzheimer's disease centers. And the NIH regards these as national treasures. And they feel as though communities should regard their na these Alzheimer's disease centers as national treasures. And the Alzheimer's disease centers were actually the first congressional centers of excellence that were established. And as Carl alluded to, uh, they were established uh, over 35 years ago in 1984. And uh, both uh, uh, Carl and uh, Dr. Finch at USC were the co-PI on one of the five original centers that were funded. And so that's a remarkable achievement and another debt of gratitude that we uh, owe to Carl. So these centers, you usually find them at major academic medical centers across the United States. There are now 31. Uh, there used to be only about 24 and they've grown over the last several years. And their goal is pretty simple. The goal is to try to translate research advances into improved diagnosis and to also try to come them up with better ways of care and to prevent and treat uh, Alzheimer's disease. Now, each center has its own uh, particular focus, uh, but there are areas that overlap. So for example, we share data, best practices, a lot of the data gets deposited in, the, in this national uh, central database, which is called NAC, which stands for the National Alzheimer's Coordinating Center. And so this just, uh, next slide, just gives you an example of the uh, core leaders of, of our Alzheimer's Disease Center. And there are a lot of fresh faces uh, up here. And, and so um, there's me, I'm the uh, director of it, and Josh is the associate director, and Andrea Wasserman is the chief administrative officer. Uh, Claudia Kawas is our uh, current clinical core uh, director, but uh, she'll soon be transitioning that over to David Saltzer to take over the clinical core. Uh, Ira Lott, many of you know, is involved in the Down Syndrome core. Maria uh, Carrada will be leading the uh, 90 plus core. Dan Gillen uh, is responsible for managing all the uh, data and is a national figure. Ed Manuki, who I think is here as well, is in, uh, the head of the Neuropathology Corps. Uh, at UCI, we're unique in that we have a core devoted to induced pluripotent stem cells, and that's uh, what Matt Blurton Jones leads. Uh, we had to establish two additional cores, uh, a biomarker core that Greg, uh, Craig Stark leads, and a research education component core that um, Liz Head uh, reads, uh, leads. So I'm going to tell you a secret. You can't tell anybody else, but um, we just got our score, and we got an excellent score, and we anticipate that our center is going to be renewed for another five years. But that's, that's a secret. <clears throat> so... Uh, I just want to give you a sense of the kind of investment we've had to do uh, just to keep our center moving forward. And since the last renewal, we hired 10 new faculty members, including uh, Josh Grill, Liz Head, uh, Dan Nation, Ruth Benka, Dave Saltzer, uh, Bryce Mander, uh, uh, Mari uh, Perez Rosenthal, and a couple, uh, Ahmad, he's here somewhere as well. And it just shows you how you constantly 
certainly have to evolve as a center. We also decided to uh, put in two new special pa uh, population cores, the 90 plus core and the Down syndrome core. Many of you know that everyone with Down syndrome eventually goes on to develop Alzheimer's disease and uh, that uh, core, that study of adults with Down syndrome has been an integral component of our center since 1985. And so we just thought it was now time to uh, separate it out. Uh, we had to invest a substantial amount of resources to get a brand new magnet it, and so we decided to leverage that and establish a new biomarker core. Uh, you could see, I mentioned already that Liz is heading up the new research uh, education component. We have a lot of new core leaders. And one of the things that uh, Josh has led has been this wonderful registry called uh, Consent to Contact. And every time I look at him, there's a new, uh, you know, the numbers go up by hundreds. So we're over 4,000 uh, right now, which I think is a, a remarkable testament to his uh, uh, leadership. So you might be asking, what kind of research do we do in the ADRC here? So I tried to put together a little slide that kind of gives you a really broad flavor of it. And you can see uh, we have a lot of work being done on stem cells. As I mentioned, we had the, we established the first iPS cell bank uh, in the uh, country. Uh, I'll be talking a lot about uh, animal models, but there's a lot of work going on here at Ir Irvine focusing on the role that influence inflammation in the brain plays in this process. We have a lot of expertise uh, here. Uh, also, a growing number of investigators are interested in studying biomarkers. You know, what are these changes that you could pick up either in blood or CSF or th structurally through MRI or other means that can help inform you about the status of the disease? Uh, you know, uh, Claudia and uh, now David and Ira and Maria doing a lot of work studying unique patient populations here. And as a matter of fact, that's one of the hallmarks of our center is that we do study very unique patient populations. I already mentioned uh, the registry and also lots of clinical trials here. So my task today is to kind of give you an overview about animal models. I've decided not to really focus a lot on the data, but to give you that big uh, 30,000 foot view. And now you might be asking yourself, why would you want to study a complex human disease like Alzheimer's in mice? And it turns out there are many practical reasons for wanting to do this. The first is that mice breed very quickly and they have a relatively short lifespan of about two to uh, three years. Uh, their brain organization is comparable to humans. It's not identical. There's some key differences, but it's close enough that we can get out meaningful information. We know that many genes and proteins and pathways are conserved between humans and mice, so therefore we could study processes and learn uh, from that. And uh, I put this in quotation mark uh, that they're relatively cheap compared to, stu uh, to human studies. And I put it in quotation marks because you should know that the university charges investigators like me a hotel bill, and sometimes our animal bill is about thirty to $40,000 per month. I mean, so we have thousands of mice, and as you can imagine, they're very expensive uh, to maintain. But there are other critical reasons why uh, mice are useful. And one is that you can shuttle human genes into the mouse, and you can get the mouse to express those human genes, particularly ones that are relevant for causing disease, and have it express in the brain, and have those mice develop phenotypes similar to what occurs in the human uh, situation. Uh, this means then you can then study processes like Carl alluded to that are just not possible to do in living humans. Generally, people who are alive don't like giving up their brain while they're alive. And then, uh, you know, one of the goals, obviously, is to be able to use these mice to evaluate new treatments. Now, there are a couple major caveats that we all have to remember in the back of our mind. And the first is that a mouse is not an accelerated human. There are a number of substantial similarities, but there are a lot of differences as well. And we have to keep that in the back of our mind as well. And so, uh, it's, you know, some of them are listed here. So 
for example, it's possible that many AD-related biochemical or pathological changes will never occur within the normal lifespan of a mouse. We know that aging is the most significant risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So if a process takes decades to develop in humans, that's just not going to be possible in the context of a uh, mouse. We also need to be realistic about how translatable some of our uh, findings are going to be. And there's a big focus in the field about developing the next generation of animal models, in particular for late onset Alzheimer's disease. And that's something that's, uh, to uh, if you attended conferences years ago, you never really heard about that. You've heard people talk about developing models of early onset Alzheimer's disease, but there's a big emphasis now on developing models of um, late onset, which is what most of us uh, suffer from. And we'll go uh, through that a little bit later. So uh, there are other uh, caveats that are uh, listed here, including the fact that if you're doing any of these preclinical studies, you really need to do them in multiple models. It's not sufficient to do it in just one animal model. That's kind of comparable to saying, I'm only going to study this uh, the disease in humans in one ethnic group like uh, Caucasians, but Caucasians that happen to come from one remote area of the world. and makes you wonder how relatable those findings are going to be uh, to other uh, areas. We have learned a lot of lessons from these animal models, including in the animal models, that the sooner you start treating, the easier it is to uh, get improvement in cognition. There seems to be a point that once the brain gets to that irreversible point, um, whatever that is, that it's no longer possible to treat this disorder. And uh, that seems to be the case even in uh, people. And the bottom line is, is that we're probably going to need combination therapies. There's not going to be a single magic bullet that's going to be useful uh, for um, on all forms of Alzheimer's disease. So why uh, was all the attention focused on developing models of early onset Alzheimer's disease. And I think if you review the genetics of Alzheimer's disease, and if we plot here uh, on this uh, graph, how frequent an allele is in the population and what your risk is for developing Alzheimer's disease. And you can define risk as either low risk, medium risk, or high risk. And then you can uh, break off the curve here and find genes that absolutely cause Alzheimer's disease. And we know that there are three genes that if you inherit one bad copy of it, will give you Alzheimer's disease with 100% certainty. And so these genes all are involved in affecting A beta production or deposition position or processing uh, to some extent. So for a mouse modeler like myself, this is a very nice handle. You want to be able to take these genes and put them into mice because you know it causes Alzheimer's disease with 100% certainty. And so that's what I and all my colleagues in the field have done so successfully. But that's not going to be useful for modeling late onset Alzheimer's disease. First of all, people with late onset Alzheimer's disease do not harbor mutations in these genes. And so the landscape now gets a little bit more dicey. So we know that there are a couple of risk factor genes, like individuals who harbor an ApoE4, for example. We know if you have uh, four, uh, two copies of the E4 allele, that you have about at least an eightfold uh, higher chance of developing it. If you have one copy, you have about one and a half to threefold uh, difference. There may, this certainly depends on your ethnic makeup and also on uh, sex as well. And uh, you could see that they're you know, somewhat common in the population. They're not relatively rare. The closer you go to the left side, the rarer it is. So there's a new gene that's been identified over the last several years called TREM2, which also has a you know, pretty uh, good risk effect, but it's relatively uh, rare in the population compared to ApoE. But then there are other genes that have been identified from these uh, genome-wide association studies, and this is where the centers have been invaluable in contributing to them, and there have been about 20 genes. And you could see that they're very common in the population, but their effect is very low, okay? 
And these genes we know are involved in things like affecting the immune system, lipid metabolism, uh, and in really critical cell cellular functions. So from a modeling point of view, it becomes much easier to try to recapitulate models of early onset where a single mutation causes the disease as opposed to um, late onset where you don't have those single mutation autosomal dominant genes that are dominating um, the uh, you know, pathology and the pathogenesis. And so I'm just gonna give you a little flavor of how we're thinking about this. But first, um, you know, my lab has made a lot of animal models over the, uh, the years. I couldn't even keep track of how many uh, we made. As uh, you know, Carl alluded to, perhaps the most famous one we made was the the uh, triple uh, uh, transgenic uh, mouse, and we had distributed that to over 200 investigators in uh, some uh, 25 countries or so. Um, and it's uh, you know been very useful for investigators trying to understand the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. You know we were able to even not only make a triple but make a quadruple transgenic mouse because we collaborated with Virginia Lee and John Trojanowski's group, and they had a, a model that had uh, Lewy body pathology in it. So we crossed it to the triples to develop a model that had plaques, tangles, and Lewy bodies. And so there are many uh, you know ways you can uh, combine these animals. Uh, over the last couple years, we've been interested in developing a mouse model for hippocampal sclerosis. So we developed a model where it's possible to wipe out about 70 to 80% of CA1 neurons, which is exactly the kind of phenotype that you see in hippocampal sclerosis. So while the mechanism of action may not be the same between those two, the outcome is uh, quite comparable. Uh, started uh, years ago working on this muscle disease called inclusion body myositis. Uh, it's a relatively rare muscle disease. Got interested in it because many of the Alzheimer's proteins that accumulate in the Alzheimer's brain also accumulate in the skeletal muscle fibers of these individuals. And ultimately, it leads them to become paralyzed. So we thought, wow, what a great way to potentially study Alzheimer's disease, not only in the brain, but we could study it uh, in uh, uh, muscle. Uh, I have to tell you as a quick aside, I had organized one of the first uh, conferences here at UCI on uh, inclusion body myositis or IBM um, as we refer to it and about three weeks after that conference I got a phone call from the uh, chair of the computer science department here asking me if I had organized a conference on IBM and I said yes I did and he says how dare you organize a conference on IBM and not involve computer science and I said I think IBM means something different to me than it does <laughs> to you. <laughs> Uh, but a lot of our work now is focused here. Uh, what you see on this model here called the human A beta knock in, which is our efforts to uh, create a model for late onset Alzheimer's disease. Now, if you look at and consider all the genetic evidence, and here's just an image from the triple transgenic animals. Uh, you know, you, the plaques are shown here in green and the tangles are shown here in red. And at least on their high power, uh, you know, uh, microscopic view, you can't tell if this is a human tissue or a mouse tissue. So the mice were very successful, not only the ones we developed, but the ones in the field of developing uh, these uh, pathologies. And yet there's been a lot of concern about the use of uh, mice and particularly why have there been so many clinical trial failures and there's probably a lot of reasons uh, for this uh, this you know the stage of the disease when we start treating uh, these individuals how the drug is being delivered uh, the suitability of the pa patient population whether or not the uh, target is getting engaged and the last issue uh, which is something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about is uh, whether or not the animal models are themselves useful and so there have been issues that that have come up, rightly so, about whether or not animal models will ever be effective. And there, some of the concerns are listed here. So for example, we know that animal models just don't get that kind of robust cell loss that you see in the Alzheimer's brain. How many of you have come to take a tour of the UCI Mind Clinics here? 
Uh, if you have not yet come, you should come. It's fascinating. One of the highlights for everyone is at the end, Andrea, uh, who usually does the presentations, will actually show you a, a human brain, and you could put on a pair of gloves and actually hold it, and everyone likes doing that. They like getting their selfie taken because they can then post it on Facebook. Uh, and it's interesting because, you know, people are like, half the people say, wow, this brain weighs more than I thought it was, and the other half say this weighs less than what I thought. But a normal human brain weighs about three pounds, and it's not unusual at the end of the day for an Alzheimer's brain to weigh about one and a half to two pounds. And so that kind of cell loss, we have not yet succeeded in reproducing in a mouse model, and that's the idea behind gen generating some of the uh, next generation models. There's some difficulties in terms of understanding how behavior in a mouse relates to behavior uh, in human. Just like with people, mice come on many different genetic backgrounds, and it's very possible that the genetic background plays a big factor in influencing the development uh, of the disease. Uh, up until this idea was focused on the next generation, most people created animal models by allowing the mouse to overproduce the Alzheimer's-related proteins. And so that could have some toxic effects in and of itself, and it's not physiologically uh, relevant. There have been a lot of legal restrictions with the distribution of these mice, which we think has hampered a lot of research progress uh, in the field. And interestingly, there have been issues with reproducibility. So it, uh, one center sees one thing with this mouse and another center sees something else. So there's a need to really uh, standardize. Uh, you have to ask the question, is the mouse ever going to be a good species to study Alzheimer's disease? And we simply don't know the answer to that. We think it may be, but at the end of the day, it may not be. But I think these experiments are going to ha uh, be uh, absolutely necessary for us to uh, do to get that answer. And then as I pointed out before, Almost all, 100% of the existing models are based on early onset Alzheimer's disease. So with these concerns, the NIA at one of their summits said, what can we do for the field? And we said they, they said we absolutely need to focus and provide resources to develop the next generation of animal models for Alzheimer's disease and related disorders. And as part of this call to action, we want to make sure that standardization of protocols and procedures and analysis is really incumbent and embedded uh, in this center so that these mice can be effectively used for drug development. We want to make sure that also the investigators align what they see with the human condition. And not only on the surface, like when you look at the surface of a car, but underneath when you lift up the trunk to look in and make sure that when you look at the cells that the changes that happen in the human brain are also happening at the uh, in the uh, mouse brain and that uh, you establish uh, really rigorous uh, guidelines for this and so this is how we got into this field and I should say that even though these uh, uh, summit points came out in 2015 we started working on this topic back in 2011 because we got a philanthropic donation of about $70,000 and we were able to start generating this new model so that when this call to action came out several years later, we were already poised and uh, ultimately received this $15 million grant. So that's not a bad return on investment from a $70,000 um, initial gift. So the NIH created this organization called Model AD. As you can see, Model AD is an acronym. It stands for Model Organism Development and Evaluation of Late Onset Alzheimer's uh, Disease. A really cool uh, term. I don't think we could have come up with a better acronym uh, than that. And so if you look at the consortium, uh, there's two major sites. There's uh, Indiana University and Jacks, and then there's uh, the UCI. So we're a little bit smaller, and we started a year later. 
later, but uh, we interact on a regular basis with the folks here in the center, which includes the uh, NIH, uh, SAGE uh, Synapse, which is where we uh, deposit all the data. And then lastly, all the mice that we create go to Jackson Labs. And you could see some of the interactions uh, that occur there. And I can tell you, we have weekly meetings with all of these uh, constituents. So what are some of the key differences between early onset and late onset? Well, the most obvious is the age that's impacted. So early onset is generally defined as less than 65 years of age, younger than 65. Uh, late onset is defined as uh, after that. I mentioned already that the genes uh, play a big role in determining the uh, condition in early onset, whereas for um, late onset, aging is a big risk factor. We know that there are certain other risk factor genes like APOE and, and GWAS. Uh, but look at the bottom line. We know that about 1 to 2 percent of the population are impacted with uh, early onset, but about 98% are impacted by late onset. And so that's why we thought it was so important to try to model late onset uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, in these uh, animals. And so if you recall from this slide, you know, we're really good at reproducing these plaques. But the mouse plaque protein is different than the human protein. And so it was very important that we went in and tried to quote unquote, humanize the human uh, protein. And so here's the approach that we took in trying to develop these animal models. The first thing is we uh, made the mouse protein look like a human protein. So there's differences at three amino acid positions at 5, 10, and 13. So using very fancy genetic tests, we went in and we uh, were able to uh, make it look like a human. Importantly, there's no mutations in this mouse. It is wild type, which is what you find in late onset AD. And because of the way we genetically manipulated it, we get physiological expressions. So the amount of protein produced is equivalent to a normal mouse. We are not overexpressing it, and that is a critical component of these next generation models. We also did another fancy genetic test where we allowed it to uh, uh, cut out the plaque protein uh, if we wanted to. And the goal here is that we will use these mice as our platform to study uh, late onset AD and to use these to evaluate uh, new drugs. So as you can imagine, like with everything in life, there are a lot of uh, challenges. It's possible, it's very likely that we're going to have to humanize many genes, not just the uh, plaque protein. It's also possible that not all the pathologies that we see in the human brain are going to develop in the mice. Uh, we know that any pathology that does develop should come in as part of the aging uh, effect, and so that means keeping these mice for really long periods of time. And we really are just now getting an understanding of how the uh, mouse background may affect us. Now, when you think about late onset AD and you look at the number of genes that are uh, affected, you could see that's a very complicated list. So how do we go through that? Well, there are a number of ways in which we're trying to uh, uh, go through this, including how significant the data is, um, you know, uh, whether or not we can understand its uh, function, whether or not it's conserved between uh, humans and uh, mice, whether or not it's in a uh, coding uh, region or if it's differentially expressed in um, the uh, Alzheimer's human brain as well. And so here's just a timeline of kind of like what we're doing. So we're prioritizing which GWAS genes we want to introduce into our animals. Uh, and we're going to then manipulate that on our platform mouse, which is the A-beta knock-in animal using uh, CRISPR, which will allow us to do it pretty quickly. We will do high capacity screening of all the models we created, but deep uh, phenotyping screening on select, the ones that are the most um, relevant. We will make sure that what we see matches up to what goes on in the human condition. Uh, we will then use those mice for preclinical testing and then uh, distribute those out as quickly as possible. And so here's just another schematic view of what we hope to accomplish. In green, we have already developed 
the platform mouse and now we are introducing other variants into this and then can use these and this is not funded as part of the work to understand the impact of the environment and diet and other uh, aspects until eventually we get our goal and are able to distribute these all out to the field. I should point out that in my view this is not a five-year project this is a 10 to 15 uh, year uh, uh, project. Uh, for sake of time, I will skip uh, this uh, slide on the deep phenotyping and just kind of summarize uh, where we are with the mouse. So we've succeeded in making uh, these mice. Uh, they produce physiological levels. They have synaptic and cognitive impairments, just like we would hope they uh, do. But more importantly, when you look under the hood of these mice, you could see key changes in key gene expression networks that are identical to what happens in the uh, Alzheimer's brain. And the mice show the potential to deposit uh, uh, plaques and tangles. And so um, here's what our roadmap looks like. Like I said, this is going to be a good 10 to 15 year project developing all these animals. So we propose to develop about 10 different uh, uh, lines that you uh, see here. And we'll be able to share all of these research, uh, resources, not only the mice, but the actual data uh, as well. They're going to be deposited on resources like ALSPEED, so uh, any investigator can go and look up any of the data that we have deposited there to figure out what is the best mouse model that they want to use for the study of uh, the question that they're asking. So I hope today I've given you a little bit of a flavor, and certainly at the conference today, you will see a lot of different approaches to studying Alzheimer's disease, ranging from clinical to uh, imaging to using tissues to cell models. And uh, I hope I gave you a little bit of a flavor of what uh, the challenges are for us trying to model this complex disease uh, in uh, animal uh, models. I hope I've convinced you that animal models have a lot of value, certainly in in terms of figuring out the mechanism, trying to figure out what accelerates or slows down the disease process, studying the impact that drugs have on the disease, better able to inform clinical uh, design, allowing um, com uh, you know comparison between existing drugs and potentially new therapeutic compounds, and also maybe uh, some of the uh, potential uh, liabilities uh, there. And so I think I'll skip this uh, next two slide and just end with this uh, here. Oh, um, all the information about Model AD is available on the website, uh, modelad.org, which is maintained by Indiana and um, UCI. Uh, I just want to give a special shout out to the UCI folks, in particular to Andrea Tenner, who uh, co-directs this uh, with me. Uh, Andrea Was or Wasserman and Stefania are responsible for running this. Uh, they're here as well, and you can see the other uh, core leaders. If you look at this consortium, it's enormous. You can see how many people are involved uh, at all the different sites. And just want to leave you with this little uh, cool uh, uh, quick video, which I think summarizes our belief um, at Irvine that for us to thrive uh, and for all of us who want a healthy mind, we need to have a healthy body. And to have a healthy body, we ha need to have a healthy world because life is truly uh, interconnected. So thank you. I really appreciate the time to be up here.